Well, the first thing you should do is read other fantasy novels. Um, you know, fantasy, unlike other types of fiction, like uh, you know, detective or mystery or western, um, is a little more liberal in terms of what you can do as far as the story is concerned. Because if you're doing a western, it pretty much tells you where the setting is, and there are certain tropes and things in a western that have to exist. You know, there are going to be horses, certain style of dress. In fantasy, that's all open. You know, depending on the type of fantasy you do, it could be Wizard of Oz with Munchkins and and Wizards and Yellow Brick Roads, or it could be George R. R. Martin's, you know, Game of Thrones series, which is more like a medieval, feudal political drama with elements of magic mixed in. So it's much broader. So you should read a lot of fantasy and determine what type of fantasy you enjoy writing. High fantasy usually involves an alternate universe with alternate uh, laws of science, physics, magic, and alternate creatures. Low fantasy takes place in the modern world and uses creatures that would be unnatural in the world, but would be natural in a high fantasy. So for instance, if you're using magic or you have magical creatures, hobbits, orcs, whatever, as in Lord of the Rings, that takes place in an alternate universe. So everything is natural for that universe. Putting those in a modern world, like with Harry Potter where he's using magic in modern day England, that is now considered low fantasy because it's a normal world and these things are now considered unnatural. It's not just satisfying the readers of the fantasy genre, it's satisfying readers. You need to have a story with a beginning, a middle, and end. There has to be conflict, there has to be uh, challenges for the hero to overcome. Anything that would be in any story has to be also in a fantasy story. I kind of try to break world building down in a similar fashion that I do research. So the first decision you have to sort of make is what time period. It doesn't matter if this is totally fictional fantasy world, sci-fi, or contemporary romance. You, you sort of have to know what time period and limitations based off a of time period or, or progression that you're, you're inspired by. After that, you kind of have to decide location. Your geography. Are they on an ice planet? Or are they living in the desert? Or are they in Florida? Like, there's totally drastic differences of how the time period and the geography interact with one another. And then those two elements decide what your limitations and bases for our culture and the background noise. Like, your character is actively a living piece of this world. So what culture are they part of? What cultures are they surrounded by? Are they in a trading hub where they get a little bit of everyone from all over, but there's like a particular uh, locals are different from imports, you know? So there's, you have to paint those, those differences concisely. And the last thing, and this sort of kind of comes back from the game development side, is that you have to decide on your mechanics. So your world mechanics, or basically your world rules. So like in a fantasy piece, you're gonna see where they're defining how magic works. You know, fire magic trumps over ice magic, ice magic trumps over water magic, and, and they try to spin it around which one's the strongest, which one's the weakest, can they combine them, all those elements. In a contemporary romance, you're a little luckier with your game, your game mechanics, your world mechanics, because you're actively usually living in the world. You know the limitations because they're the same limitations that you live by. So you don't have to do as much like writing in your Bible and keeping track of your rules, but there's still like rules that help you stay on the right plot or the plot you're aiming for or to keep your character on track. Like uh, you have a love triangle and you're aiming for, she has to end up with this guy you know, how does that happen? And is this guy jealous or is he just someone she's attracted to? Like you set up those rules and guidelines to kind of help you as you write to stay within your world limitations and help drive your plot. Granted, so your, your triangle is characters, plot, and world. So if you do it right, when you pull and tug on one piece, it's going to be dragging the other two, whether it's bringing them closer or further apart, it, it's all connected in some way to keep you on track and keep, keep everything balanced. With world building, what, what we're doing is you're creating a world um, for, for the story to take place in, basically. Um, 
the way I look at it when I'm creating a new world is uh, the, the reader, as far as I'm concerned, the reader is a tourist, just constantly looking around going, hey, what's that? Hey, what's that? And that's sort of the, uh, you know, so as I'm writing, that's exactly the kind of feel that I'm going for, you know, as, you know, to, to sort of explain to the reader, slowly unfold my world to them without dumping it all on them all at once. Um, and so basically what I'm trying to do is create a world that, uh, you know, sets up the story I want to tell and also the, the one that challenges the characters that are in the story. So, I mean, when you think of any sort of uh, a world, so like Hogwarts or Narnia or Westeros, you know, already you have all sorts of images come to mind because th these worlds have been thoroughly built for you. So the first thing you want to do is you start with the big picture and work your way down. So you're, you're not um, building from the ground up. It's, you're taking your world in sizable chunks, you know, something that you craft as you go, because you're only building enough of your world to service your story. Um, the second thing I would do is uh, create a worldview. And by that I mean, you know, each story, each character, each world, um, each setting, it should have a purpose. It should have um, a reason for being there. Uh, and so as a part of that, you know, you're going to create things like, you know, things you will consider, things like language, things like customs. You know, these are things that go into creating the, the worldview. And then lastly, I would give your world a sense of history. Um, you know, it didn't just spring up yesterday. It's going to have a sense of time and place to it. So you want to have, uh, you know, incorporate enough into that world so it's, it feels like it's been lived in for a while. Well, the first rule is that there has to be a rule and that magic must have limits. And normally what I think of is that the limit on magic is that there is a price for it. And therefore something happens to you when you devote yourself, your mind, your body to doing magic and it is often detrimental. There can be detrimental effects to the environment. There can be corruption to the populace around the area. There can certainly be corruption to the soul of the magician. So this prevents anyone doing magic from doing too much and going beyond what was meant to do. I think that in a fantasy story, if you're going to have magic in a story, you need to give a hint that there's something unusual right up front. I've just finished a new story that I'm, I'm polishing up to send to my publisher, and it has, um, it has forms of magic in it. So at the beginning, my character Catalina, who is on a ranchero in Mexican California, looks and sees the skulls of the longhorn cattle that have been made into a, a wall to save on timber. And so she looks there and she feels that someone is there looking back. She feels the presence of some being or spirit. And that gives the reader the idea this is not a normal situation there's going to be something going on in this. Yeah, and the story I'm working on because of these factors, I call historical fantasy and magical realism. Research applies to fantasy just as it does in a nonfiction book or, or, a, or a historical novel. Just because you have a, an imaginative world doesn't mean you can ignore the laws of physics and chemistry you still need to have things be consistent. Remember that human beings are going to be, well, from the planet Earth, are going to be reading your books. And if you make things too preposterous, they won't go along with you. Just for an example, if you have horses in your fantasy world and you have them running for 100 miles a day for four days straight without rest, without eating, uh, I'm, you're going to lose me because that's not going to happen, okay? And a writer's going to you know, fall over dead um, probably middle of the third day anyway. I know that because I've ridden a horse 100 miles at a stretch, and I know how much rest both of us need at the end of that. Um, if you don't at least ground your story in reality so that people can relate to it and believe that it's real, you have to get the readers to believe what you're telling them. And if there are too many inconsistencies and th just preposterous things that couldn't happen, 
without explaining them in some way through fantasy. Okay, the horses were magical, they'd been eating, you know, magical rocket fuel, and they could therefore run 100 miles a day for four days straight without eating. Okay, well, you've explained it, so we are aware that you are aware that that wouldn't normally happen. That's where the research aspect comes in. And if you don't have the personal experiences to draw on, then you either ask people who do have those experiences, you go into literature, you, you become well-versed in uh, those topics that you're dealing with. Basically, looking at tropes that may be in the subconscious that you respond to. Who person for me who did this the best was George Lucas. And I know, you know, over the years, George has gotten a bum rap. People forgot how amazing that original Star Wars trilogy was. You know, you had the princess, you had, you know, the naive farm boy who became a hero and had kind of a dead-end life. You had the bad guy with a heart of gold. These are archetypes. You had the wise and wizard and Ben Kenobi, like you had Gandalf in, you know, Lord of the Rings. And in terms of the elements of a fantasy story, to me, fantasy, when done right, is not so far out there. Fantasy expresses great truths about who we are, where we're going, where were we before, how did we get to this point now, what happens next? And with that comes, as the Peter Parker Spider-Man thing, with that power comes great responsibility. So a fantasist, to me, should be totally and utterly uncensored, free to say whatever the hell they want to say, free to get on paper whatever they want to get on paper. And you run the risk of being hated, resented, or you risk being loved in terms of the fantasy that lasts the longest. Well, let's look. Lord of the Rings, archetypes, Star Wars, great story, fun, Flash Gordon, archetypes, um, Planet of the Apes turned mankind upside down. And these are things that really continue to make one think. Um, as time progresses and history progresses, what happens is you could look back on stories that were written 50, 60 years ago. Now all of a sudden they have relevance. With everything going on in the world today politically, and I promise I won't go there unless I'm asked, um, science fiction and fantasy um, really, look, they could be escapes or they could be a safe way of looking at something. I was talking to somebody earlier today, um, a friend of mine who's hosting a new show I'm producing towards the end of the month. And we were talking about Rod Serling, who is an idol of mine and, and a hero to him. And um, with Rod, it was like he had so much to say. And he was, at times, an angry guy, very opinionated, very political. But to sort of put a soft covering on it, he had to use robots or he had to use beings from other planets or he had to, you know, basically create races to make those statements that he was trying to make about our contemporary times or the contemporary times back then that he couldn't necessarily do because he wouldn't be published in that regard or he wouldn't be produced in that regard.